Good morning, and uh, welcome back to the Pineland Speaker Series. Uh, today, we are very fortunate to have with us Allison uh, Pearson, who is the Executive Director of the White Spa Preservation Trust, and she's going to share with us uh, some of Elizabeth White's um, photographs that were taken. These are photos from the original glass negatives that they've been able to convert into images. And uh, you know, we know a lot about Elizabeth and uh, blueberries and holly and a lot of her other hobbies. Uh, but we're going to learn today about one of our other hobbies, which was photography, and uh, we're really looking forward to it. So with that, Allison, I'll pass it over to you. Hi, everyone. So I'm here at uh, Sun and Give at Elizabeth White's house, and uh, this was the house that she built here in the, what is now the State Forest in uh, 1923. So she was the first person in the family to move to the village itself and um, I'm here in her living room which is really got gorgeous views out to the Pine Barrens so here we can look out on the cranberry bogs all around the farm and she would have been able to look out on uh, all the blueberry fields at that time too. Uh, so Elizabeth uh, built her house here she has her offices downstairs and now I work for White Spog Preservation Trust, which has our offices and our archives in this building. Uh, so uh, our archives include quite a lot, and this is about our glass plate negatives. So it was one of the items that was in our archives that we were super excited to learn more about, uh, and we were able to get a grant in order to um, find out more about them and have them digitized and really stabilized for uh, future generations. Uh, so I'm going to share uh, the slideshow. I'm just going to switch over to screen share. So it's just going to take a minute to start playing. There we go. So this was actually a presentation put together by our archivist, Kiyomi Locker. She's been with us since 2018. Uh, and she came on right after we had these items um, kind of digitized. So she was able to come in and see uh, the originals and uh, the new digitized, digitized versions right after they came out. So this is Elizabeth. Uh, a lot of people think of Elizabeth when she's a bit older, but this is Elizabeth. She is the second from the right-hand side in this picture with her sisters and uh, some cousins. And this project was um, created because of a New Jersey Historical Commission grant. So we got a grant for a project grant to digitize these images and a number of other images in our collection, as well as have some items um, accessioned in our museum. So we're very thankful to the New, New Jersey Historical Commission for that. Um, and we took the work to the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts in Philadelphia. They do a fantastic job with any kind of print or paper or photographs, maps, blueprints, um, conserving them and then digitizing them. So who was Elizabeth? If you've never heard of Elizabeth Coleman White, we refer to her as the Blueberry Queen. So she was born in 1871 in New Lisbon um, and she was born into a family of cranberry growers. So her father, JJ, was very industrious. He uh, worked for a number of different um, industries in the area and then started cranberry growing in um, the late 1800s. Uh, and she also went on to um, run parts of the business and became the first president of the Cranberry, American Cranberry Growers Association, first female, um, and then later founded a blueberry um, industry, basically. So we think of Elizabeth, a lot of times we'll share pictures and she's kind of older and um, in her you know, 70s or 80s when we see images of her, but really when she starts photographing. She's quite young. So this is her at Friends Central. She, um, this is her graduation picture actually from 1890. 
And uh, she went on to take some classes at Drexel University, what was uh, Drexel Institute of Technology at the time. And we think she took some classes in chemistry and photography at the school. So they don't have exact records of what she did while she was there, but we're pretty sure she took some chemistry classes there. They were available. And she may have been part of a photography club at the time. They were popular, um, especially in the Philadelphia area. So she may have been working with some other folks who uh, did photography in the region. Uh, and we know she definitely submitted some photographs to contests. So we have several prints of one of her images that she had submitted to a, a magazine contest to be printed. Uh, so Elizabeth's quite young. At the time of this first uh, photographs that we're gonna see, she's only 25 years old. And that's Elizabeth here in the graduation picture. So this is one of her earlier pictures, Sharon Road. So her first house that she lived in was called Sharon. Um, and it, this is from 1896. So it's one of her many landscape images that we have. Uh, and you'll see this image pop up again later at a different time of the year. So these were the types of pictures that she was taking, a lot of pictures of landscapes in the Pine Barrens, as well as family members. So this one's called Girls at the Well. Um, you can see the four women who are in a landscape near a house uh, getting water from the well. So right now I'm in Senegib, and this is an image of Senegib. Senegib is in uh, Brendan T. Byrne State Forest. It's part of the Whitesbog uh, National Historic Register Village and Farm. It's quite a large area. It's 3,000 acres altogether. And this is one of 25 houses in the village. So the archives is housed here. And these are two of our archivists. So this is Kiyomi and Sarah, uh, who both work in the archives currently. Um, and our archives include photographs, blueprints, letters, ledgers, maps, negatives. We have a large collection from the True Blue Co-op, as well as from the Cranberry Farm here. And then as other farms uh, close down or uh, people pass away, we'll get donations of items, um, including letters and um, photographs, books of photographs, negatives, and um, objects. So uh, most of our physical objects are in our Cranberry and Blueberry Museum. And our staff works to scan and digitize all these items to make them available to the public. We have researchers who come in who are working on books. And uh, right now we're doing an oral history recording project. So this has been ongoing for many years. Um, and we just completed the 12th interview and we have another one uh, today, actually, this afternoon. Uh, so if you're interested in participating, definitely reach out to us. So these are the actual glass plate negatives. And these were in our collection for years and years. Um, and we didn't really have any idea of what exactly was in the images. So they're in these very fragile paper sleeves um, and the image themselves are on this glass. Uh, so we didn't wanna mess with them too much without um, having more uh, technical knowledge about how we should be treating them. Uh, so we took this box full of them, which included 39 different glass plate negatives to uh, Philadelphia. So the archivists there uh, looked through the images and gave us a full count of them. And um, we were able to look at all of the outsides of the envelopes where Elizabeth had written out the name of the image she was taking a picture of, the date of the picture, and um, it, she numbered the images, which is wonderful. Elizabeth was very detailed in um, all of her recording. So she, we have a, a book that goes with all of these images that tells us the date and the sequence that she took them in as well. So here are some examples at a morning at home where she's got the names of the people in the picture. And then the other one is from the bridge in New Lisbon. So this is the book that one of her many notebooks that tell us what she was taking pictures of at the time. So it starts out with driveway, Buttonwood, March, 1896, railroad bridge. Uh, there's some pictures of goslings, there's ferns, there's pictures of uh, some people, Beulah and Don. And then as this book goes through, it goes to 1902. 
she's taking more and more pictures of plants of the Pine Barrens. Um, and we see a lot of interest in kind of this scientific knowledge of uh, plants and uh, later on blueberries. Uh, so thinking about glass plate negatives, um, at the time, so 1851, the collagen process is introduced. Uh, so they have glass negatives that they can uh, then print. So they would sandwich them together with photographic paper and print through them with light. Um, and make direct one-to-one -one prints from them, or you could enlarge from them. Um, there was also the gelatin dry plate, which is what these are. So these are gelatin adhered to a dry plate that is then um, light sensitive and they can uh, make a um, image with this. So there's uh, some great websites out there that tell you about early uh, photography and the types of photography this is. Uh, so this time period, it's before there were instant cameras, before there was a Kodak, um, but we get into um, some of Elizabeth's photographs, which are kind of in the Eastman Kodak uh, section right after this. So here are some examples of some Kodak uh, cameras from the late 1890s. So that's what Elizabeth takes up after the glass plate negatives. So here's an example of one of the pictures. So Elizabeth is taking pictures in the Pine Barrens, but she's also traveling with her family. Um, so this one's from the Delaware Water Gap. Um, there's a historic village in that area. And these are some ladies who are making apple butter. Um, and then, so we're looking at some of the themes. So the family was one of the major themes. So this is one of the pictures. We think it, this is from the house in New Lisbon and it's called Flashlight Family Group, 1897. So Elizabeth is right in the center of this picture. JJ is laying down on the couch in the background and we see Beulah in the foreground, her aunt is there uh, and two of her other sisters are here. Um, and we get a sense of, which is wonderful, what the decorations and the interior of these houses would have looked like. So we get a sense of the furnishings and some of the artwork that's on the walls. And in the mirror, we can see there might be maybe a library on the other room, oh, other side of the room. And we get a sense of uh, the types of clothes that they are wearing at the time, which is great for our living history programs. So here's another living room photo. Um, in front of the fireplace, the ladies all seem to be doing some needlework. Uh, her aunt is reading a letter, potentially. And some of these definitely look like they were posed, like Elizabeth asked people to uh, gather together for that image. Um, so we'll look at that in, at different um, images in this collection. So this was a picture of all of the girls. So Elizabeth is here on the right, the second to the right in Lansdowne, PA, um, and they all gathered on the porch. So it's Elizabeth, her sister Anne is on the left, her sister Beulah is next to her, then one of her cousins, Mary is next to that, and Elizabeth, and then another one of their cousins. So here, it's kind of hard to see in this, it's a landscape in the Pine Barrens, it's along the water, and right in the middle is Beulah with Max the dog. So they had a um, golden retriever that was a family dog, and um, she is playing with Max along the edge of the water. Uh, and we've heard from a couple of people, they think they know where this spot is uh, at White Spock, but we'll see. Uh, now this is George, White and his family. So again, we see her cousin sitting on the porch in the rocking chair um, and this beautiful wraparound porch with a view out to the landscape. So some other folks that she took pictures of, she took pictures of people who were around the farm, people um, who were working, some of the Italian workers. This one's just titled Miss Gaskill, Washerwoman from 1897. It's a beautiful portrait and we get a sense of, uh, you know, living situations for people at this time. William Munyon and family. So a nice little porch in the Pine Barrens. This looks a lot like some of our um, smaller cottages and you get a sense of the family and kind of where they were living. This is the Reeves children. So uh, we guess that this is probably uh, descendants or family members of Bob Reeves, who we interviewed last year, um, who's local and has a lot of um, historic 
stories to tell. He's written some books on the area. Uh, but this is a really nice portrait of the kids on the porch. And again, the Reeves family, so Will Reeves and family. Uh, and I love the um, clothing that these people are wearing with some great outfits from this time period, 1898. Um, and they're right on a bridge and really just sitting in the sand. So a very informal kind of portrait. And then Dan Deberg, and this I think is right in front of um, their house. Uh, this You'll see this fence come up again in this kind of portico on the side of the house. So this is 1896. And we have a couple of portraits of this gentleman. Um, and then this is an unusual picture. So the group at the fence, so we've got uh, Elizabeth's sisters again, Beulah and Anne are in this one, oh, sorry, and Mary, and then her cousins, and then the gentleman in the front who's holding a handgun is um, one of the Bartram family. So we actually shared this with Bartram's Gardens uh, to see if they knew who this gentleman was and um, if he's a direct descendant to uh, John Bartram. Um, so we talked a little bit about that in our presentation with uh, Bartram's Gardens. Um, and we do know that there was some collaboration between the two sites. So Elizabeth was aware of the Bartrams and we have the Franklinia plant here from Bartram's Gardens. Uh, but this is just such an interesting portrait of this group. And now buildings and landscapes, those are some of her major themes. And we have a lot of um, winter scenes in this. So we've got some snowy scenes. Split rail fence and lane in the snow from 1904. This is from the farm itself. So it's uh, the beginning of the Cranberry Packing House. So this is the first section of the Cranberry Packing House. If you turn to the right, it would be the Whitesbog General Store. So this is what you pass on the entry drive and is what is in the parking lot right now. Um, so this is the first section and there would be two more sections of this building added right behind this. Uh, so there was a loading dock and you can see there's a wagon with a cart pulled up and some ducks possibly in the pond here. So where the fishing um, pier is right now, that's where the ducks are at this point in the picture. So this was the what we call the old bog at White's Bog. And this and the next are uh, some pictures. It says looking west from dam number two and looking east from dam number three. So this is uh, what would be cranberry bogs, and it looks like they've been recently cleared of um, vegetation and some uh, branches and things. So here's Sharon Lane again, but this one is on a cloudy day. And some of these pictures when we're looking at uh, Sharon Lane on a bright sunny day versus a cloudy day or her family portrait with a flashlight. Some of them sound like school assignments you would get in a photography class, like, oh, go out and take some pictures with the flashlight and see how that works, or take some pictures on a cloudy day and then take more pictures on a sunny day and see how they compare. So I wonder if uh, she was getting some direction from um, people in a photographic group or in a class at Drexel to uh, take different kinds of themes. Um, and this is a woodland snow scene. And Anybody who has taken pictures in the snow on film knows that it's really kind of difficult to uh, get the right exposure. So there's a little bit of like a, a burning or exposure issue on the right hand corner of this image. Uh, but this is very nice and we see a, a trail that's going through the woods and all the trees with uh, snow on them. And you can see a split rail fence on the left hand side there. So here's another one, tree with snow. This is 1904. And this is such a delicate, beautiful picture. Spider web with dew. So this is probably just something that she saw around the farm early morning that she set it out to take pictures. And um, this is from 1897. Smokehouse in the snow. And we're not sure where this is located. So these are not buildings that are in existence at White's Bog. Um, we're not sure exactly where this, this farm would have been. Um, and it may be more from the um, collection at the Delaware Water Gap, but I'm not sure. 
And then this out from Dance House Bridge. So it's interesting. We were talking with some people who know Browns Mills and New Lisbon to get a sense of where the dance house was and where the bridge was. Um, but a nice landscape. Here's uh, Delaware Water Gap again. This is north from Council Rock. Uh, beautiful landscape. And we could probably line this up with a uh, landscape today and compare and contrast. And then this is the family house. So this is in New Lisbon, and this is what is now the uh, Pineless Commission offices. So uh, some of their offices are in the original house that Elizabeth grew up in. So this, you probably couldn't get this view. I think this side of the house is the side with the uh, new museum and new building. And then we have goslings in a basket. Elizabeth was very fond of taking pictures of um, geese and goslings and kittens and uh, other animals around the farm. So these are lined up in the basket. And those are some of the images that she submitted to photographic contests. So here's another one of the goslings all waiting in a little pond. And these are from 1899. And then uh, Elizabeth has quite a large collection of portraits of plants. So she was going out in the field and finding plants. Sometimes she's probably taking pictures of the uh, plants in um, their location and maybe taking a board or a piece of paper and putting it behind the plant so that they are easier to see. Uh, this one is of roses. We know she took many pictures of um, Orchids of the Pine Barren, some of the more rare and endangered plants, some um, gentians. Um, she was very interested in um, any kind of botany in the Pine Barrens. Um, and later she would develop her um, gardens here at Whitesbog that many people would come and visit to see these uh, native plants of the Pine Barrens. And this from the bridge, New Lisbon. So we talked to um, one of our um, Regulars here is John Nallinger, who is, lives in Browns Mills and has lived here a long time. And he said that this doesn't exist anymore. This body of water is no longer there. Um, but this was a pond or, you know, lake in New Lisbon uh, that you could go out from the bridge and see these little uh, piers and small houses and people boating um, at that time. And then this is in Philadelphia. So she's taking some pictures um, on her travels. This is the Church of the Advocate at 18th and Diamond. Uh, and this was actually another winter picture. She took this in February. Uh, so we have this view of the church and then this view of the other side of the church. So the west window of the Church of the Advocate. And this is what the building looks like today. So it's still there. Um, and it's known for social justice and community outreach, which doesn't surprise us since um, Elizabeth's family were Quakers and she spent a lot of her um, later years working on um, as an advocate for children and for people with disabilities in the Pine Barrens. Some farm images. So while she is taking these pictures, she's also working and helping out on the farm. So her father is running the cranberry farm here and at the time, they would have up to 600 workers from South Philadelphia who would come out to pick the cranberries every fall. Um, so uh, we've heard that Elizabeth and her father would go and uh, purchase produce and food for all the workers. They would go to Philadelphia to the markets to collect all these things. And then um, in September, families would come out on the train and uh, begin working and living in White's Box. So she would spend a, a good amount of time with the workers. We've got some pictures of her at um, packing houses and um, providing tickets to workers. And some of her sisters would help out on the farm as well. But Elizabeth definitely took the most interest in the farm and the farm business out of um, her and all of her sisters. So we can see here a um, padrone who is looking over a group of um, workers who are picking. And in the foreground, there's some um, peck boxes that are filled with cranberries. And uh, one of the notes said that 
these sticks what they would use to help show the workers underneath the uh, branches where all of the berries were. They could root around to find more of the berries. And then this is an interior picture. We don't have very many interior pictures, but this is probably our packing house. And you can see the original barrels that they used to pack the cranberries in, and then groups of women and men who were at the uh, sorting tables who were sorting through all of the cranberries. And this it was a very exciting image to get digitized because um, in the new digital version that we have of this, because um, the Conservation Center is making such high resolution digital images from these, we can see every button on this gentleman's vest. It is so much detail that we couldn't see before in the copies that we had. So it's really nice that we have um, access to some new technologies and new uh, materials to really see these things in greater detail, which then we can zoom into the pictures and see things that we would never have been able to see before in, um, in our historic records, which is fantastic. Um, so this is just such a beautiful picture. And we'll probably see this in the um, Cranberry and Blueberry Museum blown up on a wall in the future. And this is uh, one of the very first envelopes I showed you is babies of the cranberry bog. So the babies were out in the cranberry bog. The families in the cranberry picking um, industry would really just, it would be the whole family from grandmom down to the little kids. So they brought out an umbrella to shade the little babies as they were sitting out in the bogs while the families were around and uh, picking all the cranberries around them. And Elizabeth, so that was the last of those pictures. So this is a picture of Elizabeth. Uh, she continued to photograph her whole life as far as we know. And this is a picture of her. She is lining up blueberries on a piece of glass so that she can compare that uh, variety of blueberries and look at the size of the berries and the quality of the berries that were coming out of each plant. So she's doing her experiments with blueberries at this time. And over her is a ladder and then her camera. So what's underneath that cloth is uh, the camera itself. So she would be uh, putting plates into the back of this camera and um, exposing each one of these images and then uh, creating a new plate. Um, and you can see she's got her uh, measuring tool next to her where she can see the size of the berries um, and they would select berries based on their size, as well as the quality of the berry. And you can see um, she's looking at all of those. So up in the upper right-hand corner, it talks about which cross each one of these is. And we have many of her uh, documents that show she's crossing the ruble with a different variety. And um, they're trying you know, thousands and thousands of different blueberries to come up with the the selection that she really wants to uh, bring to market. So you can visit uh, White's Bog Preservation Trust and uh, visit the historic village at any time. We're in Brennan T. Burn State Forest. So we're open all the time for hikers and uh, bikers. We've got lots of people who come out on horseback ride as well. And uh, we also provide tours uh, during a typical year. We would have house tours of Sunning Hill, uh, but we're doing more digital tours and virtual tours at this point. And every Saturday we have a market in the village. So that's from 10 to two, uh, weather permitting through the winter. And uh, you can come and join us at the uh, general store and learn more about uh, White Spog and pick up a map. And then uh, we're providing some public programs. So some Saturdays we open uh, the cottages and some of the museums so people can walk through because most of the buildings have uh, multiple doors. So there's lots of airflow through the building. Um, and then we're gonna provide some more uh, behind the scenes tours because we do have 25 different buildings. Uh, we are working to provide more tours of more of the sites to the public. Um, but if you go to our website, whitespog.org, we're actually uh, redesigning the website right now. Uh, you'll find all of our programs. You'll find out more about our archives. You can find out how to contact us um, and learn more about us, as well as make a donation and become a member, which is vital. So we are supported uh, solely through 
sales at the store, through grants, uh, mostly from the state of New Jersey and through donations and memberships. Um, we don't get any money from the State Forest of New Jersey, uh, but they do allow us to use this space, which is wonderful, so we can provide interpretation. And we've been doing that for just about 40 years now, which is uh, really exciting. So thank you. Uh, if you have questions, you can call in and um, Joel is going to answer your question or answer your uh, call if you call in. Allison, thank you very much. That was really interesting, man. It's great to see some of the, you know, Elizabeth had the the thinking ahead to document so many of those things. That it's really neat. And I also like that mm -hmm. experimental quality. You know, some of those pictures, she obviously definitely was experimenting to see how they would come out. So that's really interesting, uh, you know, facet that I didn't really understand about Elizabeth White. Yeah. Yeah, we had to do a lot of research at the time to understand uh, how many women were photographing at that time. Like there was also a Philadelphia Museum of Art um, exhibit about women photographers right around that time. So it was interesting. We reached out to them to ask, like, how often were women photographing at this time? Um, and she definitely suggested that it was more well-to-do families that had access to cameras and um, yep. And uh, it, certainly in order for Elizabeth to be able to go to Drexel and take classes at that time, they, they would have had to been better off. But, um, but it's really exciting to think about, you know, what women were doing at that time. And then, then to see the, the practical application of her using the photographs in the blueberry research, that's, that's like, you know, mm -hmm. full circle there. That really uh, yeah. is a, a, a neat, neat facet to know about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we have uh, her paper records as well as her photographic records of blueberry. So that's a, another whole selection of our archives is her blueberry photographs, which we have hundreds of. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it really, you know, it really seemed like she was very meticulous, uh, particularly good yeah. at organizing and uh, all those straights that, that you really need to have to, uh, to go through to research, all scientific method, everything that, uh, you know, we appreciate today. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, if anyone else yeah, has, yeah, it's so a... wonderful. Go ahead. You go ahead. You're good. It's so wonderful to have so much detail in uh, the records here to be able to see, like, oh, she was in New Orleans with her family at this time, I and mean, we really can trace what she was doing each year because she has so many detailed records. Yeah, that, that's that's just uh, you really neat. Even like the interior of the house, it's just great to see. It's yeah. like a view inside their lives. Uh, that yeah, mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. Yeah, and I'm excited to come and visit uh, when we're allowed to get out <laughs> around again uh, to visit the uh, Pylons Commission and see the interiors of the building. Is the interior any any way similar, or is it completely renovated? No, the interior is very in a lot of ways as. Um, you know, uh, it's been restored a few times, but it was more or less restored and stabilized. So you can still oh, wow. see uh, the, the original rooms. You can still see the rooms that are added on. Uh, it's choppy in nature where you see they added this section, they added that section. And um, mm. the photographs are great because then you can look back and say, oh, yep, that's when they did that renovation in uh, uh, 1901. And then you can see a photograph right. beforehand and see where they made those changes. Um, oh, wow. So yeah, you would you would probably really appreciate. Uh, and once we do get back, feel free to come. And uh, you know, the things I like about it are the trim and all the the fancier um, pieces of the building are still there. You know, the doorways yeah. are very elaborate, and uh, you know, all things that you wouldn't have seen uh, in today's construction, but was very important back when they uh, you know were building the house. I guess it was originally built, I think, probably around 1826 um, by Benjamin Jones who was the uncle oh, wow. of, uh, who was her grandfather's uncle, uh, J James Fenwick. And so in, 19, in 1844, I think when Benjamin Jones passed away, eventually it comes to, to James Fenwick and uh, thus Fenwick Manor. Hmm. But Benjamin was uh, one of the you know, owners of Hanover Furnace over on Fort Dix. Uh, oh, and I always like to say that, you know, Fenwick Manor had something to do with the iron industry, the blueberry industry, the cranberry industry, and today it houses the New Jersey Pinelands Commission. And it's that that circle that comes back around and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all important parts of, uh, you know, why we preserve and protect the Pinelands. 
Yeah, and Sharon doesn't exist anymore. Apparently, Sharon has been raised at some point. So it's really nice that uh, her one of her childhood homes does still exist, and we could visit it today. Yep. Yeah, the interior pictures also help us when we do interpretation here in the village. Most of the interior finishes are gone in the houses, so we still have the woodwork but we don't know what wallpaper they had up or what flooring they had or what kind of fabrics they were using. So those pictures really help us get a sense of what it really looked like when they were living here in the house. Yep. And that was a great shot of inside the uh, packing house where they were working with the blueberry, with the cranberries. That, that'll be really mm -hmm. neat to see that blown up in, uh, in full detail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited for when we can take these pictures much bigger too. <laughs> well, if anyone's out there and has a question, uh, feel free to call in. Uh, the number's on the screen. Uh, you just dial the number and then put in the meeting ID and I'll bring you in live uh, to our uh, presentation. Uh, going forward into 2021, have you guys, um, made any tentative plans or talked about the blueberry festival or anything like that yet this year? Yeah, we actually, so we have a, a rough plan. So we are going to celebrate blueberry season all season long this year. We're planning um, a kickoff event, a closing event and weekend markets every Saturday. So from June 26th to August 7th, we're planning um, blueberry celebrations. We're going to have pre-orders for blueberries, for blueberry plants, for blueberry pies every weekend, um, because we want to provide some flexibility. We don't plan on having any mega events this year. Um, so we're certainly not going to have, you know, 8,000 people show up at White's Park in, right. in the summer. Um, but we're looking at mini events, which this past year we did the Saturday markets. And that was really wonderful. We had maybe, you know, 100 to uh, 200 people who would come on a weekend and not all at the same time spread out during right. the course of the day. Um, so we didn't have any big crowds, but people were still able to come and enjoy blueberries and pick blueberries in the blueberry field and, um, and see all the different parts of the village and take a, a wagon tour or something like that in our open okay. air wagons. Um, so that's what we're planning for this year. And um, you know, with flexibility, certainly we're in the state forest. So whatever the state of New Jersey chooses to do um, dictates what we're doing. Uh, so that that's worked out pretty well for us. We've had some medium sized events for uh, cranberry season last year. Um, and that was really nice. People were able to walk around and talk to vendors and uh, be spread out through the whole village, which, you know, we have, thousands of acres over here. So it's nice to be able to spread out. Yeah, that's great. You know, the smaller scale and uh, spread out over longer periods of time. In some ways that is more mm -hmm. convenient because your people aren't just jammed into that one weekend. They can take more time yeah. and really appreciate the buildings uh, and the grounds and uh, not be in a rush. Uh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we've had a lot of people say, you know, in the past, like, oh, I never go to Blueberry Festival because it's too crowded. I don't like when it's so crowded. So <laughs> you certainly don't have to deal with parking issues if you just come on like a random Saturday or Sunday to come visit the village. So that's really nice. And uh, do you have plans to continue some of the uh, student uh, programs and field trips that traditionally uh, went on there? Yeah, so we've had... Um, Girl Scouts primarily and uh, some Boy Scout groups who have been coming out. Um, it came out this fall. We did a uh, playing in the past program with some uh, group of Girl Scouts around cranberry season. And then um, right before the holidays, we had a big group of Boy Scouts that came out who were camping at Brendan Burn and then uh, did some cleanup and trail work here with us. Um, so we're working on some virtual programs for school groups. Um, and once schools kind of get a little settled and into a you know routine <laughs> we are able to provide um, some virtual tours and virtual programs with our educator Jessica uh, where we can do a pond dip with students we can take them on a virtual hike um, and uh, if groups are actually getting together to do in-person activities um, they can come out we have plenty of room to spread out and stay outdoors and we're happy right. to do that in most weather pretty much 
Um, so yeah, our hopes are hopefully by summer, we'll be back to uh, kind of regular field trips with um, Pemberton schools in the 21st century program. Okay, great. Well, I, I we've wait, we waited for a while. You know, the calls are hit, hit or miss. You never know. Sometimes we get calls, sometimes we <laughs> don't. Um, yeah. But uh, that was a really fascinating look back in the time. And, you know, I just think about Elizabeth, what a superstar she was in so many ways. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I would say in today's terms, you know, you would say she was just way ahead of time and, you know, uh, really um, is a great example of, uh, you know, the things that you could do when there's limits and, you know, some of the things she was doing, she probably wasn't supposed to do. And she just did on her own and um, <laughs> she went about her own thing and, and, and made her own way. Yeah. And we learned more and more about her as we were researching and going through the collections. It's, it's wonderful to learn. Um, and there's actually a, a scholarship for girls in the region for uh, STEM education and science education um, that's named after her. So that's really nice. Uh, that, that's awesome. Uh, Thank you very much. And uh, I guess on that note, I think we will wrap it up and I will uh, shut down the live stream. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you.